Hello and welcome to this edition of Faith and the Common Good, brought to you by North Coast United Methodist Church. I am your host, Pastor Harris. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to continued conversation with you about the issues in our community that affect us all. As we lift up those issues, we look toward the common good and how we together can serve one another to make this community the best that it can possibly be. Our guest today is Kathleen Higgins, who is the executive director of Operation Hope Vista. And she and I will be in conversation about uh, homelessness as it relates to matters of family and a related issue, uh, that being domestic violence. Thank you, Kathleen, for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. And it is so good to meet you. And uh, even though you've been here for a year in this area, I welcome you to the community. Thank you. Uh, it's good to have you back home in Southern California and uh, also good to have you as the leader at the Operation Hope uh, Shelter. Uh, so firstly, I'd like you to share with us uh, what you do and what the organization does. I am the executive director of Operation Hope Vista. We are. Uh, an emergency overnight shelter. We have 45 beds. We serve primarily families with six beds reserved for single women in a, in a six bed dorm. Uh, we, I'm struggling with the words because we used to operate between November 1st and March 31st, but I'm pleased to say that starting on August 1st, we will be a year round mm -hmm. overnight shelter. So this is a big deal. Yes. Um, we, the first uh, first one for families in North County. Um, so this is, it, you know, this is a time of change in the county in terms of how some of the city governments are relating to homelessness and figuring out how to address them in more humane um, ways, but also more successful ways. Mm -hmm. There's certainly homeless shelters that serve um, the broader area, but I think distinctive among that work is your work of serving families. And so if you could talk about that just a little bit, um, why this particular shelter chose to work with families versus the, you know, the total population. Well, I think one of the things that, um, having come from the south side of Chicago, one of the things that really interested me in this job specifically is that we may in North County not be responding to homelessness perfectly, but what we are doing right is that the shelter system up here has focused the different agencies on the different types of homelessness. Mm -hmm. And why that's important is that as each of us focuses on the area that we are good at, it allows us to drill down deeper and get at some of the root issues mm -hmm. that brought them to homelessness, mm -hmm. whereas if you have ever been in like a traditional urban shelter, you know that they're trying to serve all the different categories of homeless and really that's just sort of running around trying to keep all the plates in the air. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's exciting to be, you know, if we have a homeless man come, we know that there are a couple different places we can send them. If there's a migrant worker, we know that La Posada can serve them. And it frees us up to do the deep work. Mm -hmm. And so for us families, Number one, it was the children. I mean, we serve more children each season than we do adults because mm -hmm. the families come with children. Mm -hmm. And we know that the homelessness, the effect of, homel of homelessness on children is catastrophic at, at an early age. It will have lasting um, impressions on their ability to learn, on their ability to form uh, relationships that are healthy, uh, even simple things like their health systems, because they're not eating proper food or enough food, those aren't developing properly. So for us, um, it just seemed like a no brainer that we would focus on the families. And 13 years ago, that's what we started doing. We started out, uh, Vista came to a couple of leaders in the community and said, we need to do something. If we give you some money, will you figure something out. So four houses of faith got together and started out with a rotational shelter and they did that for several years and Vista realized, okay, this, this needs more attention than that. So they did, they uh, gave us a building, an old warehouse, and we then were able to provide shelter in the stationary shelter, which was a huge improvement because you know how hard it is to do mm -hmm. rotational shelter. Mm -hmm. And then we were lucky enough to um, get a really good price on the former Vista Community Clinic building. And I think really where this has transitioned and really grown the program is that now we are able to offer the families mm -hmm. 
individual private rooms. And more than addressing the issues that got them to homelessness, this is allowing them to develop the families mm -hmm. and to reestablish those family bonds mm -hmm. and to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. That's, it, it's just really a blessing to be able to watch that happen Absolutely. every day. Certainly yeah. so. And I, I think that public awareness has expanded just slightly, mm -hmm. but there is still perhaps a hesitancy to accept the fact that there are children involved in uh, matters of displacement in, in homeless issues where families who are able on a daily basis to go to work, but not yet able to afford a roof over their heads. Can you talk about that a little bit? Maybe a yes. story? Uh, uh, yes, we have, um, we have lots of stories. Um, I think probably one of the reasons that we don't see the homeless people on the streets that are families is because they have, they're either living in their cars or they're couch surfing um, or maybe they're doubled up three families to, an, to a one bedroom apartment, which it's not an ideal way to raise a child or be have a happy life. So we are focused on working with the different agencies within the community, the school districts, the houses of faith, because maybe a lot of times how we wind up with a family is a house of somebody at a house of faith has encountered a family, they have pooled their resources and tried to provide support, maybe nights in a motel, mm -hmm. that's a big one. Mm -hmm. And then they'll see that it isn't as easily resolvable as they thought it was, mm -hmm. and then they call us and said, well, you know, we've had this family, uh, we've been paying for them to stay in the motel for two weeks, and we've you know done all of this, but we're still not able to figure out how to get mm -hmm. them a house. That's when they'll come to us. Mm -hmm. um, I think a, a good example is we had one family that came from Chula Vista uh, because we were the only shelter that uh, could take all of the family unit. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, the family was wanting the girls to stay in their home school, which was a two hour bus ride each way. Mm -hmm. That's a lot for an eight year old. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got the team together, worked with everybody, and then showed them that enrolling them in the local school was going to be just as beneficial to the children. Mm -hmm. And they were able to find housing up here, and so now they're reestablished up here. So I think everybody's experience with homelessness in the beginning is that person who maybe has a mental health issue that they see on the street or, you know, a lot of people reference for me. There's a, a woman who resides in the canyon area at Hacienda and Melrose in Vista, or is that Oceanside? I'm not really sure. And everybody says, well, I stopped and tried to offer her some information about where resources were, where she could get to shelter, and she would say things like, well, I've been there, and I don't like there, and I've done there, and they say, well, she must just like being homeless. She must um, want to be homeless. Well, no, nobody wants to be homeless. The reason that she chooses to live in the canyon is because she has, I'm, I'm fairly certain, I don't know this for a fact, that an undiagnosed mental health issue. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with schizophrenia or um, psychosis, when you're in a shelter environment, which is extremely loud and extremely rigid, it exacerbates the illness. Sure. So now she doesn't want, why would you go somewhere where it makes you feel worse? Mm -hmm. And so when you start to explain these things to people, they start to see the bigger picture. Sure. Okay, it's a much more complex sure. problem. And I think that, um, always relates back to the families. We struggled to get a year-round permit to operate until we explained that homelessness isn't a winter issue. Nobody wants to live in their car with their children when it's 80 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. So it isn't a winter issue, it's a social issue. Mm -hmm. And once we started changing those minds, I think we've come around. Surely. And to that end, understanding the comprehensive nature of the resolution which is, uh, yes, supplying, as we've spoken earlier, the sustenance uh, 
concerns, uh, making sure that there is a roof, making sure that there is food, making sure that the children are able to attend their varying classes in whatever location, but also this notion of why is it that homelessness continues to exist and why is it that it tends to be on the increase. So we have to look at not only the social issue, we have to look at the economic issue, we have to look at all of the supportive factors that are integrated one with the other. Um, and our tendency still is to um, silo our various work, which is a good thing about the work that you're doing because you're working with varying agencies that include uh, those questions about economic development yeah. and mental health and uh, physical health, et cetera. Um, so what do you see then? as um, possibilities, especially for preserving the physical and mental health of our children, because I see that as our next major issue to deal with. As children move through this absence of security, those memories are never really lost no, and no, can no. become either positive or negative, depending upon the kind of nurturing that a child is able to experience. Are there any places where not only immediate concerns are being looked at, but also future concerns are being looked at? I think for us at, at Operation Hope, one of the things that we um, have learned in this journey in 13 years is exactly what you're saying. Uh, so our program has grown to include, we have a after school program. We used to call it homework club till the kids would say, I don't have any homework. Uh -huh. mm, we're on to that. Uh, so there, in with retired school teachers, retired superintendent, so they're getting one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And we're also providing the adults who are in shelter are required to go to classes every night uh, where they're learning financial planning mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know things that I think some of us take for granted, sure. but if nobody's ever taught it to you, and so yes, on the surface, many of these things are things that are causing their homelessness and the kids were helping through this program we identified a child who is seven in kindergarten does not know his colors his abcs and could not complete a mm -hmm. pre preschool puzzle mm -hmm. there's an that that put us into immediate action with the school district because obviously he's falling through the cracks and if we don't act soon, he will be forever Surely. lost. Well, we'll continue this conversation in just a few minutes and I want to thank you and hold that point. We'll okay. continue to talk about cause and effect, if you will. Thank you so very much for joining us in this conversation and we look forward to uh, continuing and invite you to stay tuned. This is Zoe. She's one and she's running for president, potentially in 2064. Because if she's kept safe and eats well, has the opportunity to learn and grow, if she has help getting ahead and support along the way, then Zoe could be president. Like her hero, Ava Bam Binken, help kids like Zoe dream big. The why for early learning, child care, mentorship, and more. For a better us. Donate to the why at zoeforpresident.net. I never chew tobacco. I don't drink much. Never smoked a cigarette in my life. HPV. Isn't that about cervical cancer? What does that have to do with oral cancer? HPV, didn't know that. Welcome back to this edition of Faith and the Common Good brought to you by North Coast United Methodist Church. We are in conversation with Kathleen Higgins who is the Executive Director of Operation Hope Vista. Uh, Operation Hope Vista addresses the issues of homelessness uh, by sheltering and by uh, development of both uh, psychological as well as mental health as well as financial concerns related to homelessness. And we will continue our conversation as we begin to talk about causes of homelessness. Again, thank you Kathleen and thank welcome you. back. Um, let's spend just a few minutes talking about uh, what are the causes of homelessness. I think specific to North County, uh, we, we know for one, it, the housing stock is not there. 
so that makes the rent prices go higher. But not only that, we just, the county started out 20 years ago up here as sort of a sleepy farm town with a military base. And the infrastructure and the program, the, the programs that were built around that were geared toward that. In a very short period of time, we have become what is in effect a metropolitan suburban community with those types of problems. Unfortunately, the infrastructure hasn't necessarily kept up. So now we're starting to see some of what we traditionally consider to be urban issues, um, which is uh, homelessness, mm -hmm. domestic violence, and, and the inability for us to address all of the victims of domestic violence because the infrastructure hasn't kept up. Um, we do see quite a few women, uh, about 48% of the women that came through the shelter this season can directly or indirectly attribute their homelessness to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So it is a serious issue and needs a lot more resources Certainly. thrown at it. Certainly. I will say that we did have one, it was a father and two sons and they were victims of um, domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So it, it isn't entirely a women's problem, but mostly, so if I say she or her, it's mm -hmm. that, that's sure. the easier. Um, but I think also uh, nearly every single person in the shelter had a job this season. Mm -hmm yet still couldn't afford to keep a roof over their head. And I think what's shocking to people who have not been in this situation, a perfect example is we had two different families, a mother and a daughter, and then a mother and she had four children. And they figured out that they couldn't afford any housing on their own, so they decided that they would live together. Now under the HUD rules, they're technically still considered homeless if they're doubling up. But in North County, you have to figure out, you gotta do what you have to do. So. They found a place. What happened next is that what we forget, those of us who have our own home or who are happily ensconced in an apartment, is that every time you apply, it's a 30 to $50 charge. Mm -hmm. And because the housing stock is so low in availability, it took them 13 applications to find some place that they were approved for. Mm -hmm. So you do 13 times 50 and you realize that even though they've been working and saving all this money, all that money went out the door for mm -hmm. not a whole lot. Um, so it isn't so much that get a job, which is I think what a lot of people consider the main problem to be. A lot of people have jobs. It doesn't pay the bills. It doesn't keep a roof over their heads. And the awareness is that, well, you've offered us three or four awarenesses, and I'd just like to lift them up again. One, the overall economic um, system, uh, in a way, contributes to the factor of, of homelessness by virtue of either not earning enough money or by engaging the few dollars that one has on not necessarily superfluous, but certainly things that don't really apply directly to the immediate need. And then um, the next issue that you've raised for us is that uh, homelessness in some cases, in this case 40% of your clientele, mm -hmm. is attributed to domestic violence factors. Mm -hmm. And domestic violence is one of those things that we are still, as a community, quite uncomfortable in uh, oh, discussing. Yes. And then the factor that it's not only an issue for women, it's also an issue for, for men. Mm -hmm. And then fourthly, when one is working, um, job today means something completely different than it did 40 or 50 years ago. So that whole definition of job changes, not only with how it is affecting the family directly, but the fact that job means something different in, yeah. in this environment. And so the issues are related to one another. Uh, the issues are more and more intense as our economy begins to find its new way and its new voice. So what do we do to advance in our ability to eradicate homelessness? I think as a community, there are a couple issues that we really need to focus on and push our legislators and local community lawmakers into considering and taking action on. The first being affordable child care. We have women that want to work, can work, but they're, they're literally spending three quarters of their paycheck on childcare. The, you, you, can, you start to get to the point where you can afford childcare, you can afford a roof over your head, and food isn't even in there. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to figure out as a community how to be better at being able to provide childcare for these working mothers, mm -hmm. working single dads. Mm -hmm. 
um, that's a huge problem. The second problem, and probably will be my, is my button issue, um, lack of mental health care. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that is, well, one of the areas that's the fastest growing in domestic violence is the abuse of parents by minor children. Mm -hmm. And this is almost entirely, I'd say 90 plus percent of the time, because the child has either an undiagnosed or an untreated mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. So the system is now set up such that there, there are no mental health beds in the county for children. Mm -hmm. The systems that allow for even just counseling are so small that the wait lists are up to a year plus long. Mm -hmm. But the city also says, when you call and say, my child is out of control and hurting us, mm -hmm. there are no resources. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we really need to take and shine a bright light on, as uncomfortable as it is, because nobody wants to think that, you know, this child is acting out in such a way that they're causing harm. It's happening. I've taken calls from parents who literally say things like, I, we have locked ourselves in our room. Mm -hmm. We're being held hostage by our child. Mm -hmm. That isn't a child. Children aren't born that way. That is a child who needs medical attention. So that's, that's a huge one. Uh, I think we also have to really think about what does it mean supportive or affordable housing? Uh, you know, across the county, we've seen these new apartment buildings go up along the train line, mm -hmm. and a one bedroom in those units is fifteen or sixteen hundred dollars. That's what they consider affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but if you're working twelve or thirteen dollars an hour, that's more than you make. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there has to be some serious conversations mm -hmm. around what affordable housing really means. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that, there's a little nimby in that. Nobody wants you know to think that there's affordable housing because they associate certain behaviors or certain types of people with affordable housing. And I encourage people to investigate that. Mm -hmm. And actually what you're calling us to do is expand our perspective, generally speaking, uh, in that we are our brothers and sisters keepers and we do have a responsibility to one another. Uh, much of our American or, or more generally our Western society imports the fact that we are independent and individualistic. Well, in fact, we are not. We are a collective of people who work together to support one another and to uh, assist one another in elevating both idea as well as uh, uh, quality of life and, and those other issues that affect all of us together. And I think that would be the, the primary concern. We tend, again, to think in individual perspective or individual community perspective without realizing that we're all affected. And the least of us... Yes then becomes the definition for the rest, for of, the rest us. of us. And so we have to be careful about mm -hmm. uh, supporting that which we consider to be, um, quote unquote, the, the least. So thank you for sharing uh, and thank you for the, the work that you do in that regard. We've talked about the concerns. Do you have a success story that you can share with us? Oh, absolutely. Um, we had a couple of really great um, clients this season. Uh, probably the best story I have, um, we had a gentleman, um, it was a family, a mother, a father, and some kids, and the gentleman was unemployed. He's a skilled carpenter, does beautiful work, and was looking for work, and she was going to school, and at our shelter, for financial reasons, we don't have, we have a kitchen, but not a cooking kitchen, because we can't afford the insurance and whatnot. So every night, dinner is brought in by outside uh, groups, so church groups, civic groups, clubs, um, and you know it's a big undertaking to cook for 50 people. Mm -hmm. But what we've discovered in this, and the real blessing in this, is that then we encourage the groups to sit and break bread mm -hmm. with the clients mm -hmm. and just get to know each other. This is important as a learning tool for the groups providing the meal, but it's an opportunity for the clients to see themselves as valued members yes. of the community. Yes. Because when you become homeless, you feel like you're invisible and nobody sees you and the community doesn't care about you. Mm -hmm. So we encourage both sides in preparation of their time together about what they should expect, but also encouraging them about what they should be doing and yes. listening for. Yes. And one of the clients took the advice and was having a conversation and the gentleman asked him what he did and next thing, he said, well, do you have a resume? And he said, in my, in my, in my room, brought him a resume. And he said, okay, this is good. I'll, I'm going to call you. And you know, you never know where that's going to lead. The next morning at nine o'clock, he got a call. 
can you be here in an hour? And by noon that day, he had a job. Mm -hmm. And so the family successfully moved out of their, uh, out of the shelter. They're into an apartment. She got a job working at Sprouts and uh, almost immediately learned that if she had a food handler's license, she could make more money. So she asked us to help her figure out how to do that. And there she was at night, you know, 11 o'clock after work, after the kids went to bed, doing the work to get her food handler's license. And so I think they're the epitome of of what we're seeing in the shelter. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that isn't what most people think of when they think of a homeless person. And, and what you're saying about the traditional idea that, you know, 50 years ago, most homeless people were men who were out of work. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the, the average age of a homeless ch person in the United States of America is nine years old. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way for five years now. So when you look at it that way, um, really, what kind of a community do we want to live in? Sure. And what do we want to be giving to our children? Sure. Sure. That's huge. Sure. We have just a few minutes left, and I'd like to ask you then the question of advocacy and other ways of networking. Churches, temples, and mosques, and other uh, faith entities are supporting the work that you do. How can the larger community also participate in um, your work? We rely on volunteers to get our, to support the staff, but to also get the work done. Mm -hmm. um, about 100 volunteers a week are support, actively supporting the program. Mm -hmm. There's a job for everyone, whether you want to work in the office, whether you want to work directly with clients, you want to answer the phones. Um, if there's something you're particularly interested in, I can almost guarantee you that there's a place for you. Mm -hmm. We provide the training. Um, and the staff support, so we'll make sure that you're having a good experience, but I'll tell you, it'll probably be one of the most rewarding things you've ever done. Mm -hmm. Kathleen, I want to thank you again for being a part of today's conversation, and we look forward to continuing that conversation as we work together. Um, and to our community, we want to encourage you to become involved in some way, if nothing more than beginning to examine the perspectives that you may have about the issue of homelessness, the issue of domestic violence, the issue of economic development in our area, so that we might uh, together find ways to uplift all of us, all of us together, so that we are able to live our best lives together. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Faith in the Common Good, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.